Hey guys, Khali from Cricket Fanatics Magazine here. And to celebrate our 40th episode of the Unlockdown series, we got a special guest with us. Guys, you've been asking for it, and I so I asked, and we've got Aiden Markham on the show today. So you know that the show is about you and you guys getting to know Aiden a little better. And through your comments and your questions in the comment section, you'll get to know you guys a little better too. So welcome to the show, Aiden. Thanks, Alice. Thanks. Look forward to it. Yeah, awesome, man. So let's just start with uh, the lockdown. Um, and from a cricketer's perspective, what have you been up to with regards to um, keeping fit and um, obviously keeping your, if you had a chance to keep your cricketing skill sharp, what sort of things have you been doing? Yeah, look, to be honest, from a cricket perspective, it's been quite challenging. Um, not been able to have people over and, and you know, like, not, not many people here that can help me. So, uh, the cricket side of things is a bit of a challenge. Um, but from a keeping fit, I think we, we're doing as much as we can. Um, we've been saying programs that we're trying to do, and I think the last couple of weeks have helped quite a bit that we can be running and things like that. So it's been, it's been good, um, or as good as it can be, I suppose. Um, but it'll be nice to, to get out and about again and be with the various teams and things like that as well. Mm. So you obviously would have had a lot of time then from, we've spoken to some other cricketers too, and they said that they had a lot of time to actually think about things and men, work on their mental game. Um, is that something that you've been been doing? It has been, yeah. Look, I think before lockdown, I was injured for quite a while as well. Um, so hmm. I've had quite a bit of time to think about the game and the mental side of things. But I mean, it almost gets to a stage where it becomes pretty stagnant as well because you you sort of cover all bases from your from your mental side of things and from there there's not, not too much more you can do so you get out and, and into onto the field again. So there, there's been time for it and there's definitely been a place for it as well. Um, but yeah, like I said, as for now we we we're trying to do as much as we can and uh, from in terms of all aspects to keep busy and, and, and try and prove where where and when we can. Okay, awesome. So let's go into the section that these guys really enjoy. It's getting to know you a little bit better and about your past a little better. So um, let's go into the, the beginning for you because, like you know, the title of my of the site is Cricket Fanatics, and um, we all start as cricket fans first um, before we get into anything. You you get to love the dream and play um, something that you love for a living. <laughs> but let's start with how you got introduced to cricket. I'm sure it's, it's from a very young age. Um, so I come from quite a big sporting background. Both my parents played a lot of sports and then my dad's side of the family were um, and still are sports mad. So um, look, they, my dad and, and he's, he's got three brothers and they were, were rugby crazy growing up um, and, and they all played at pretty good levels and, and enjoyed their rugby. Um, but from a cricket thing, I think it was always as far back as I can remember, it was that uh, my gran and grandpa's life when all of us as a family would get together. That's sort of as far back as I can remember. That's when sort of the love for the game started. Uh, I realized that it's something I really enjoy doing. Um, and then you, you, you're lucky you, you go to your school cricket and you get involved in the, the school system. And from there, it's, it's much of a madness for everyone. But I think, yeah, through my family, especially my dad's side of the family, the, his three brothers, um, and my grandpa, we, we, and they still are, everyone's still sports mad. So it became quite easy to fall in love with sports and, and pick it being the, the one. Yeah, so was there a lot of um, battles in the backyard and et cetera of them throwing yeah. some balls at you? <laughs> yeah, 100%. Look, I think I annoyed them more than anything else. Because uh, <laughs> they obviously just wanted to catch up and be with the family and I was nagging them to come play outside and, and whatever. Um, but between the three or the four, the, the four brothers and my dad and his three brothers, between the four of them, uh, the competitive energy is massive. Um, so I, I think I got a lot of competitiveness from them as well. So I mean, there's, there's loads of funny stories from, from the family gatherings and stuff. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, great memories. And, and uh, yeah, like I said, I think that's pretty much where it all, it all started. Yeah, so obviously going into school, um, so cricket was was that always your first the 
the only sport that you really want to play. I mean, we had you, you don't have many options when you when you go to school uh, from a summer sports perspective. But um, was was cricket always on the radar for you from the beginning? It was definitely the the sport that I it was up there in terms of I, I had the most enjoyment to or playing. Um, I really enjoyed rugby as well, but uh, that was complete enjoyment, not because I was any good at it. Um, but it was nice, and like you say, you can't play cricket all year round. So rugby was the winter sport that I really enjoyed, and I think it also, like I mentioned, out that a lot of my family came from the rugby background. Um, so probably between the two of them is, is the two that I've had the most enjoyment from and, and two that I still follow religiously when I can on TV and, and all those sorts of things. Um, but I think if, if you think as far back as primary school, it's almost the case that you, you try every single sport. Um, and I think it was like that for a lot of people. So I do remember playing your tennis as your golf, uh, doing swimming. Um, you, you do give everything a crack to do. Cricket and rugby were the two that we were really just like miles ahead of the, of the rest in terms of actual enjoyment and, and looking forward to playing in after school time with them. Yeah, um, Aiden, we're getting some um, comments in the comment section saying that you, they can't really hear you very clearly. Um, no. Is it? Yeah, is it? I don't know if it's. The, I think the side is the oh, mic. Is it much, much better? better. Wow, that's better. Oh, guys, is, guys, oh, is that okay? <laughs> Just let us know in the comment section if that's a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> because I can, I can hear it because I have earphones on. So you guys have to obviously yeah. be our, our ears out there. Cool. So, uh, um, better now, I think, yeah, sorry, man. No, no problem. So, um, let's, let's continue, Aiden. So let's talk about school, primary school first. Um, when did you start getting introduced into, into Red Bull cricket and taking that seriously? Sure. Uh, when you speak Red Bull, you obviously speak in you know, the, the longer format, uh, or, or like hard ball cricket. Hard, hard ball cricket. Hard ball cricket. Hard sorry. Ball cricket. Um, <laughs> No, 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 don't press. Uh, <laughs> I think, I can't actually remember. I think we only started hardball cricket, I think from 11-ish or so. Mm. I could be wrong. Or maybe it's from the next step from under nine. Um, if I remember correctly, we went, the school I was in, we went under nine, under 11, under 13. So I think from the under 11 teams, that you either 10 or 11, if I'm not mistaken, we started with a hardball. Um and yeah, look, for me at the time, it was much of a muchness. I thought it's cool now that we we play with the same ball that our heroes on TV are playing with and mm. um, all those sorts of things. But I, I don't think it changed too much. I think it was all just the excitement to play and the excitement to get in the net after school and mess around with your friends. Um, but yeah, I think to answer your question, I, I would assume it was around 10, 11 years old when we started with the, the harder ball. Mm. So... What was the, okay? For obviously, you want to play for fun at first. Um, that's the, obviously the reason yeah. why you want to play. Um, you at that particular time in your in your career, who were the guys that you looked up to? Look, I always remember it, and it's it's a very funny one. But I always remember from a South African cricket perspective, it was always Mark Boucher and Joe Cullis that I I love watching and, and and follow closely. And one of my dad's really good friends. Um, Sean Free, he played cricket with um, Mark Boucher in in the Eastern Cape uh, when it was still border days, um, and it played in that like, brown and, and white. Uh, was it Benton and Edges? Or I mean, it was ages ago. Um, yeah. And because I, I knew my dad, didn't know Boucher at all, but he's very good friends is with he's very good friends with Bouch. I, I almost was just like, okay, Bouch is the guy that I enjoy, and then. Jock Callis, I think almost every young guy that followed cricket loved Jock yeah. Callis. Um, so it was the two of them off my top of my head, and then naturally AB came into the picture um, and Graham. And yeah, look, it it's, sounds quite funny because now a lot of them are still involved and <laughs> yeah. are running the setup. Um, but to be fair, I haven't been involved too much uh, since they've taken over because um, of the injuries and whatever. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, those would be the few guys that. Uh, I remember as quite a young guy looking up to and, and wanting to be like one day. Yeah. Yeah. 
guys, don't worry. I will get to your questions later on in the show. I'm just let, you have to just give me my time to enjoy the interview with Aiden first. <laughs> so, so Aiden, let's talk about uh, your your career with regards to high school, and obviously that's probably where your where your cricket really took off. Um, because obviously we all know about. We will get to the point of the Under 19 World Cup and what that was like. But what were some what were some of your your highlights of your high school career and maybe some of the the lows for you um where you where you really struggle to get through that because obviously being teenagers we all gonna go through the same things um yeah <laughs> okay maybe maybe not like you uh, not maybe you weren't uh, didn't have the problems like us normal teenagers have with girls etc but with other things that you went through. <laughs> no, <man. laughs> not at all <laughs> so um, what look i yes i don't know i think when you're young like that you your problems always well, for me, it was, I always made my problems seem so much worse than what they were. Um, <laughs> so you get out and you, it's like the end of the world, you know what I'm saying? You're mm. throwing your everything and you're eating your everything and you're like so mad and whatever. Um, and then you grow up and you mature and you get probably towards the back end of your school career and you realize it's actually not that bad and mm. you're stressing more for an exam that you haven't studied for or whatever. <laughs> and um, that was, I think, yeah, that was at the, the times when I realized it. Look, I didn't nail it at all, but I, I, I realized that it's actually, it's a great game and I love this game and I want to make it. Um, but I never played provincial cricket during high school. So mm. I enjoyed it and we had such a nice um, team at school. Uh, loads of, that I'm still really good friends with um, now still to this day. And we had such a nice team. And I remember there was a stage where we were, challenging for first in the country or, or were first in the country. Um, and that was really cool. I mean, that was the, the pinnacle of my of my um, school cricket career, mm. so to speak. Um, yeah. It was in our matric year and, and we, we we had like sort of done done well. I mean, we were, we were so the, the website said, I don't know if it was legit or not, but we were challenging in the top three the whole time and, and pushing for first. And that was, that was really cool. Um, yeah. If I think of the struggles, uh, it would probably be the disappointments of not making the provincial teams. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, when you're young like that, it's, you, you make a team like the be-all and end-all, you know what I'm saying? You want to yeah. make the under-15 week, under-17 week, and then in matric, you want to make the Coke week side. And yeah. the, it's a lot worse in your mind then than if Aiden can sit right now and uh, looking back, I can be like it. It's nowhere near as important as I made it seem when I was that age. Yeah. So those are those would probably be the the highs and lows that I can yeah. think of on the top of my head. Because I want to get into a little bit more into that psyche because we have a lot of guys in this that, that follow us that are aspiring cricketers, and you can you can get to that stage. Like I know your path and some other cricketers' paths as well have not been as as meteoric as some others. Like some people will go through the system, school system, play province provincial cricket from a young age and right through the system and just go straight into franchise teams where yours was a lot tougher um give me a thought of that process of that psyche um why what was your opinion on why you wouldn't didn't make provincial sides or how did you handle that because i mean we'll get into your university later after that but let's just talk about that high school period where you felt what did you go what went through your mind oh i think if I think back to so my under 13 and under 15 weeks, uh, I was at Cornwall. So Cornwall wasn't, um, if you compare it back then to your massive schools in Pretoria, mm -hmm. um, from a sporting perspective, they, they wouldn't even challenge. So for me to think as a guy in Cornwall that I'm now going to make the Northern team is it's quite a far-fetched idea. So it doesn't really affect me too much when I was at Cornwall and um, I, I wasn't it was quite hard to gauge how good you were because we never really played against the best we played against very good schools but we never played against the Uffies and the Boys Eyes and the Menlo Parks uh, of Pretoria so back then it was actually okay for me um, and then I moved I moved schools and I went to Pretoria Boys and I realized that actually this cricket thing is now cool and I got a better gauge of my abilities and and the 17 week, um, it was, uh, I'm trying to, I can't think of that far back, but 
Um, I can definitely tell you from the Coke perspective, I, I had a good I had a good run in the trick, but at the actual trials, I, I was pathetic. So um, huh. I didn't give the, the select as much ammo to fight with. So um, although I, I was scoring a few runs in the league, um, obviously the trials, and I remember the trials here in Pretoria, it's almost like a, a three or four day thing where it's wow. put into different districts and it's quite a process. Yeah, it's not like it's they like pick 22 players and, of the, and then from those 22, they like pick the Coke side. It's, it's quite a process where there's four or five districts and then each, you play each district once and then they pick their best two teams and they play each other and then they pick their Coke Week spot from there. So mm-hmm. it was quite a process. So I'd been given many a crack to, to score runs and show the selectors I can play, but in those five or six games, I, I could barely get to double figures. So at the end of the day, for, for that Coke Week selection, I was my own worst enemy. So um, I've never to this day had, had grief about it. It's, it's always sat pretty well with me. So the disappointment of not being there was the only thing I dealt with, but it wasn't that I got given the short end of the stick or anything like that, because like I said, it was all on, on my own shoulders for that. Yeah, and then obviously... Is there any advice you can give to guys that went through something similar to you? If if there's something that you could have told that old Aiden back then, that piece of advice, what would yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, the advice from an advice perspective, it's it's quite tough. But if I think back and could speak to the old Aiden, I would try and make him realize that it's actually not that big of a deal, um, and it's taking nothing away from the system and, and nothing away of the the steps you can take. Cause if you can spend your time in those provincial teams, it is going to make you a better player because you're exposed to the best in the country at your age. Um, but I'm not the only example where a lot of guys didn't make those provincial teams and they went on to make a success out of cricket. So, I mean, if I could speak to myself back then, it would be a case of, it's almost like a bonus if you can get into that side. But if you can't, it's quite easy to still, to still crack on and, and make make a success of cricket and, and get yourself into environments where you thought you would never be and, and didn't see yourself fitting into. Yeah, so let's talk about that famous World Cup then. Um, the selection process, when you heard, found out that you were going to be a part of that team, um, how you went about that, and obviously becoming the captain. Um, that must have been an amazing, amazing experience for you. It was, it was, and it was very unexpected as well. Um, we had... Uh, Ray, long story short, Ray somehow uh, got a hold of my name from Marie Kutsia, who was playing SN19 at the time. Um, and Ray was monitoring the Coke Week. Uh, I think it was the one either before my year was or the one of my year, I can't remember off mm-hmm. the top of my head. Um, and Ray went to Marie because him and Marie got on really well and uh, asked Marie, is there not a few more batters in the Pretoria region? Because I think Ray expected or knows that there's always, I don't want to say a few hard done by, but a few guys who don't make the team that can still play cricket um, in the Pretoria region because the, the school cricket is so competitive and so good. Yeah. Um, so I think because of that, Murray named a few names. Um, it wasn't like he just named me. There were a few, three or four, five names that he named. And then Ray had like a, a massive talent identification camp where there were about uh, 35, 40 players, um, all of us in matric, and he was able to scout from there. Um, and he made a massive move and picked me for the under-19 side, that tour to India. So not the World Cup, just the tour to India where we played India, Australia, and Zimbabwe was there. So it was like a quadrangular series. Um, and he picked me off the back of nothing. Um, no one knew who I was. And Ray just believed in his gut or whatever it was and, and got his way. Um, and I went to India and had an absolute nightmare. Um, also, I think I had eight knocks there, top score of 26, average about 12, maybe not even 12. Wow. So, absolute nightmare. He backed me for every game, played me every game, and nothing happened. Um, so, we got back, and I thought, oh, you know what, that, that was my chance, and it's gone now, but it's fine. It's not the end of the world. We'll uh, play cricket after school and see if anything can happen from there. Um, and Ray was still very persistent um, and said, no. Make sure Aaron gets to the Cubs week for um, the Titans Cubs week team. Um, so we went to that and did okay in that Cubs week, better than uh, I did in India. Um, and then 
from that Cubs week that picked the World Cup side because the Cubs week was start of Jan, and I think we went to the World Cup in February or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. So it was quite a quick transition. Um, mm. So now everyone at the Cubs week and all the guys have done well are thinking, are they, they going to make that World Cup side? And, um, you know, they're busy stressing and stuff. And I had already made peace in my own mind because of the, of the prior India tour where I struggled so much. I was like, I had eight chances. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there's definitely, he's definitely going to move on to, to clean a pastures sort of like, um, and Ray was adamant. I mean, I, at very best case scenario, I was going to go as a, res- a non-traveling reserve. That was, I mean, the peace of mind, or the, the bit of that I was at best hoping for. And Ray was still adamant that he wanted me to captain the side. And it was something that struck me with such big surprise. And you could have seen everyone at that Cubs week were like, no way. This is such an awful decision. This guy went to India and he was useless and whatever. Um, and yeah, I think... I was lucky enough that a guy like Ray obviously has seen what he had seen, being an IPL coach then, and he had coached countries and um, obviously played really at the highest level as well. Um, that I was so lucky he could just back his gut and, and I mean, it, it worked out well for, for our under-19 side. And Yeah, the World Cup was great and yes, it was it's, it's quite a story where it, it wasn't like you say, the, the normal went through each phase and, and sort of hung my cap at each phase because there was a lot of times where uh, I can admit to you I didn't deserve to be wearing an SNA 19 shirt because I'd been given my chances. Oh. Um, so, yeah, it's quite a cool story, I think. And like I said, a lot of credit has to go to Ray and, um, for helping him back his gut and, and getting his way. I think he had loads of fights with selectors and but he eventually by hook or by crook got his way being the type of person he is and, you know, a lot of credit has to go to him. Yeah, wow. So I, I think a lot of people after that glory, after picking up, lifting that trophy as a captain and um, playing with the likes of Rabada and 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 those guys that, that you are now still playing with, have obviously at the national, at the international level. And some of the guys that you played against you are, are, were in part of that tournament, like someone like Yadav, who was, uh, was a person that would have been in that tournament against sure. you and et cetera. So, um, but I don't think a lot of people know that there was a period after the World Cup where you you focused on your studies and you played for your university um, yeah. cricket. It wasn't a straight transition for, for, for you there either, straight into the franchise cricket. No, no, so no. Te, can you maybe give me some insight into those two years of, of, of your life before you got came and played for the Titans and then since then, <laughs> history? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, um, I'd obviously had made peace uh, with the fact that after school I was going to study because I didn't make coke weeks and um, I wouldn't I didn't get cricket bursaries and all those sorts of things like a lot of uh, guys who go to coke week get and, and, and rightly so because they've earned it. Um, so I'd made peace with the fact that I, I'm going to study and I'm going to still take my cricket seriously at sucks, but mm-hmm. naturally I'm studying at sucks, so that takes the it is the priority because it's what we're paying massive money to do and. Uh, if I don't, pa- or don't pass, all of that is a waste. So, um, studied and took it really seriously. Um, but at the same time, I was with uh, the Tux Academy as well. So, that was really cool because throughout the year, every single day of the year, you're doing something regarding cricket. And that was cool. And that's obviously what I wanted to do. So, I said, I can, I can still study doing this. Um, but it's cool to give cricket almost not, not a last shot because that also makes it sound very extreme, but to give it a proper shot of being exposed to cricket outside of school and I'm doing it day in and day out and working with great coaches and there's great players that are involved with Bucks um, that I get to rub shoulders with. So I almost saw it as like a kind of last shot, but a really cool opportunity as well. Um, so to cut a long story short, I played in my first year out of school for the Tuck second side um, was studying and then second day out of school uh, was in the, the, the first side for Tux. And we, it was the first year of that Red Bull, uh, varsity T20 World Campus Challenge or whatever it was. So we played the, the, the first varsity cup T20 where Tux plays Martis and whatever. And then the winner of that went to, we went to India, if I'm not mistaken, to represent South Africa from a, from a, from a, a varsity perspective. So it is quite a, it's quite a confusing 
um, thing. But all those small things that I went through was really cool to experience. And we did very well as a tuck side under Pierre de Brain then and Alden Smith, who, who's now in New Zealand. We did really well. And he, he grew a lot of players and, and challenged a lot of mm-hmm. players and I'm dead with a lot of players. Um, but all for the good and all to, to bring out the best in him. And it was, it was a really good tuck system we had. I think our, there was a stage where all six teams had, had, were first or second in their league. And I think just the system was great at tuck. And I, I learned so much of my cricket there and, and through Pia. Um, so yeah, and then from there, um, played a season of the amateur cricket and then yeah, on to Titans. But I think you, you, you do always have to think you're going to study off the school. You can't just expect to make yeah. it. Um, yeah. I think that the odds are always against you and it's not to say that you're not good enough. But it's just, if you think of the percentages, it's, it's probably not ever in your favor. And, and your mindset always has to be that you've got something else to fall back on if, if it doesn't work out. Okay, awesome. So, guys, that's the basic background. Um, I know that I, I'm going to ask a lot of the questions that you guys want to ask, so I might as well just ask your questions. So get your questions in now. I'm going to start at the top. Aiden, for you, it's going to seem quite random because <laughs> I'm just going to ask them as they pop up in the section, uh, the comment section. So they might not be okay. all on one topic. <laughs> so no, let's no, start. No, no. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to start with Sadiq um, first and foremost. He says you played from between one to five, mostly in every position in domestic cricket, in one-day cricket. What is your preferred position in ODI and T20Is? Or in two um, look, if I had to say right now, it would probably be somewhere in the top three um, because it's where I've played most of my cricket. So yeah, at the domestic level, yes, I have done four and five, but I haven't done it as much as I've done the top three. Um, so I've, I've naturally learned how to that and, and developed game plans in the top three, which I'm a lot more confident in than I am at, at positions four and five. So if I had to pick now, um, it would it would be anywhere in the top three, I'd be pretty comfortable. Hmm. Okay, another one here is from Ravi. He wants to know, I've been meaning to ask you this for question for some time. As a batsman, do you have a pitch in the backyard with a bowling machine? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've actually thought about getting one going there, but uh, lockdown is making it difficult but no i don't um, we spend enough time at the stadium so when we get home it's normally nice to <laughs> just get away from it all cool so this is an awesome one um best innings you play domestically or internationally i know what my favorite is of yours but let's go with yours what is your best innings that you play domestically or internationally uh, i think the most satisfying knock that i played is um in a losing cause which is strange um but it was when we beat us, I mean, lost Australia in the first test of mm. the, the series when they were here. Um, I think our backs were against the wall and it was sort of my first challenge as a, because my, my, no one said I'd been challenged because no one, well, it was against you and bubbles in your Bangladeshes, which for me was still a huge challenge and it was really difficult. Um, but I think the pressure that came was playing Australia and, and, and such a big series and then our backs were against the wall. On a, on a wicket that was turning and then they were reversing the ball. Um, that, for my own confidence and belief, was the most satisfying knock I've played. Um, made a few faults, yes, it wasn't a faultless knock at all, but like I said, in terms of the belief side of things, and, uh, believing you can do something at this level, was that was the, the toughest and, and the most satisfying knock. Um, if I have to think of the most fluent I've ever felt and would be the fourth test against Australia at one mm. um, that was but that was just a, a day where everything happens to go your way and so yeah those are the two that come to mind um, off the top of my head yeah it was amazing I was there to watch it so it was incredible to see it live as well <laughs> feels like um, 10 years ago <laughs> People talk about uh, switching on and off during their innings and different players have different methods to do it. Um, what do you do? Um, it's not a, it's not like a conscious effort that I, I make to switch on and switch off. Um, I actually enjoy staying almost like ever present to pick up on small things that I can from a non striker then. Um, I don't think mental fatigue plays 
such a big role whilst you're in the middle. I think it plays more of a role off the field and between games when you have time off to reflect. But I think once you're in the game, uh, there's enough adrenaline and, and, and natural energy around the stadium that sort of keeps you going. Hmm. Um, so I've never really had a, 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 a plan or a, a fixed idea on how to switch off because um, if I did find myself gazing off into the crowd or whatever, I was fine with it. And then I also, if, if I did catch myself analyzing or whatever the case might have been while I'm batting, I was also fine with it. So I haven't actually really looked too much into it. Um, I'm sure there's benefits both ways. Um, and I can see, absolutely see the benefits in being able to switch off mm. whilst you're batting because it can only prolong it. Uh, but yeah, to, I'm not giving you the answer to you after, but uh, it's not something that I <laughs> consciously make an effort to do. So I unfortunately can't help. Yeah, but that's your opinion, so that's good. Uh, it's yeah, a nice yeah, follow. Yeah, yeah, here's a nice follow-up question, though, from him. His first twenty balls, they say, is important in constructing the innings. When do you feel like you are in normally? Sure, I, I do think, in, if I can speak from a Test cricket perspective, um, a lot longer than that, to be honest. Uh, I feel the bowlers just keep coming at you in Test cricket. And for as long as there's, there's something in the wicket or as, for as long as the ball's just doing something, um, it never quite feels like you're 100% in. Um, and that's probably the challenge of test cricket. So, yeah, it, it's sometimes a lot longer than 20 balls. And if you then think white ball cricket, I think there's days where you can fill in after five balls. Um, yeah. You look at a guy like Quinny, but he can literally <laughs> smoke his first two to the boundary and he's in. Um, so I think there's a very big difference between the different formats. Um, but if I can answer from a test cricket or the longer version of the game, some, there's some days where it almost feels like you're never in it and you just tend to scratch around and by hook or by crook stay in. Or, yeah, it's sometimes quite difficult. Cool. And then um, who is your favourite all-time finisher in cricket? Finisher? Um, it's... <laughs> From what I've watched, it's it's quite hard to say. Um, I've played quite a bit with Fudgy um, in the in the Titans team, so that's Farhan Bealdin, and he just he's finished games where I've I've never thought we're getting over the line, and I've always been like, how are we going to do this? And he's just been the guy that's always got it done. So from a a being then person and experience and it um, perspective, he, he's the first guy that comes to my mind and. Um, Almost like there's no challenges to him going around the domestic circuit. Um, and I say that with the utmost respect. Uh, you'd have to think, watching cricket from so from a supporter's seat, MS Donia has finished games um, incredibly well and is obviously known, had got the name of he, he's the finisher. So he, 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 from a supporter's seat, it would, it would be MS for sure. Cool, awesome. Another one from Sadiq. He says, your career so far is a roller coaster one. You had a couple of big hundreds versus Australia and then it's slided down during Sri Lanka and India. Where do you think it went wrong and what are you looking to improve? I'm um, sure. The, the, the Sri Lanka series was in South Africa and in the India series was away. Um, and both of them had their own unique challenges. Uh, mm. I remember the the Sri Lanka series, the wickets actually being incredibly sporty. Um, and it was, there's days where a guy like Ash would come off and just be like, even he's never in his batting now for the last three hours. And it just keeps going around. Um, and I found that really challenging because that was a series where we as a side wanted to be as convincing as we can be um, and get ourselves into positions where we can uh, be ruthless and, and be strong in the opposition and we just never did and the harder we tried the worse it got sort of vibe um, so from that series I would almost say our faults were trying a bit too hard um, one thing results in, in, in a test series right now is probably the worst thing you can be after you've got to be you've got to be happy to earn it over days and days and days and I think because we won it so badly we we would push things and rush the game and rush the processes and um, and then India naturally was was a struggle. Um, I know there's quite a few question marks about my spin, and and I've I've acknowledged them loads in the past, and I can accept them for sure. 
Um, yeah. But if I look back to that series, I'd got out to see him just as much. So uh, that was, I, I still haven't put my, my, my finger on it, but where I went completely wrong because it could have actually been preparation in the sense that I put so much focus on my spin. Um, I forgot how to face their quality quicks as well. So um, something we're still trying to nail. I haven't nailed it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But we, we, we're trying, and yeah, off the top of my head, those would be the few things that come to mind. Cool. This is a tough one. You can decide if you want to answer it or not. <laughs> but uh, any thoughts on maybe batting a bit lower at number four in tests, seeing that Peter Morana is just coming to the team and s- some middle spots are open, still open? Yeah, look, I'll be honest. I don't think I'm in a stage where I can uh, pick and choose where I want to bat. Um, yeah. If there was a position at number four and, and, and I got offered it, I'd absolutely take it. Um, but to answer your question, my focus now is just to get back into the test team. Like you said, Peter's there and he's done well. And he's done well in the domestic surf circuit for years and years and, and deserves a fair crack at test cricket. Um, mm. So my my focus is to just get back into the team. So um, I, I've not thought about... Um, batting forward, but I do believe that the transition between opening and four in Test cricket is much of a muchness because your processes are allowed to remain the same. Whereas mm. if you compare it to white ball cricket, you've got to have a bit of a different skill set walking in at number four. For example, in the 35th over, and you can't quite take your time. You just need to crack on. Yeah. For an example, um, I'd be comfortable doing it absolutely. Um, but like I said, my focus now is to just try find a spot um, in that side again. Awesome. Um, so this one, I'm going to spin it around a bit because uh, I think that for you coming in, you were young, coming into the system. And obviously, a lot of the players that you played against would have been some of the guys that you looked up to. So can you maybe um, give me some, insp- or say, tell me about this question, basically. Who did you learn from, though, from the guys that you have looked mm-hmm. up to so far? Which guys have so you I think... In terms of test cricket, I never played with AB too much. Um, so off the top of my head, guys like Ash and Faf have been instrumental in, in helping me learn. Um, I've naturally spent more time with them um, compared to JP and AB because they cut their, their test careers before Ash and, mm. and, and Faf did. So I've spent more time with Ash and Faf. Um, and I honestly learned so much underneath them. And it, it feels like it's easy learning. Um, it never feels forced. It could just be a simple discussion and learning will just take place. Um, so they're the two that come to mind um, that I do learn a lot from. Um, from a coaching perspective, um, I know it's not a, a, a part of the question, but I feel like I must have, I'd say it is that Boucher's had quite a big role in my um Preparation and, and the way I've trained for a test match, it's, trained, it's changed quite a bit since I've been able to work with him. Um, and that's not since he's been protest coach. That was when he came into the Titans mix, which mm. was about two or three years ago, um, up until the protest, when he got the protest job. So that time when we were both at the Titans, um, I learned a hell of a lot under him as well. Can you maybe give me some insight into that? I've asked questions before about um, what type of coach Mark Boucher is and um, we, we don't get to actually see that first hand, but at the Titans, what type of coach is he? Like, uh, because obviously you now have played amongst different coaches now. Um, yeah. So well, what is Boucher like? What, what makes him special? Um, look, I think he played 150 test matches for South Africa. So he knows the exact intensity at which test cricket needs to get played. Um, yeah. And that was the way we trained at the Titans. So we trained at an intensity level of test match cricket um, without us knowing his players, but that was what um, Bouch was used to. So that's how he trained us because he was used to playing under that intensity that he brought that straight from playing into coaching. Um, Mm. And that, I think, was probably the biggest difference because that intensity that you do feel in test cricket is very hard to simulate during training. Um, And if you don't have a guy who's as experienced as, as Bouch is, uh, you're going to struggle to come up with ways to simulate that. Um, so that was probably the biggest thing. Um, there's Naturally, his knowledge and experience helps a lot, but for me, the biggest difference was the intensity of which I would train and, and prepare for games, a lot more specific and um, 
it might at times be short and sharper, but the, the intensity is always through the roof, and that's how you need to train because you'll always be under pressure if that's the case. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, so I've, I've kind of seen that um, how he trains with you guys at, at the sessions, etc., and the intensity that he that he expects from you guys. So it's, it's amazing to actually see that. Um, I, I felt it especially in the. I know we didn't have a great um, series against England, and but um, with regards to the switch when it was when the ODIs came around and the ODI team came together, it was a very new, fresh team, and I could just feel mm. the energy like change, shift in the in in, in the team. Yeah, and, and uh, it was unbelievable to actually witness that and be there and see that. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Yeah. So, Aiden, I'm going to ask you another one here from Gio, who says, your first ever cricket bat you received. You currently with GM, but what was the first ever cricket mm. bat that you that you played? That no, you no, it wasn't. Um, it was a, a Schlesinger back then. Mm. Um, it was a, I think it was a V600. So I remember it definitely being a Schlesinger, and I remember it having a purple V. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a V600. Uh, no. As far back as I can think, that's that's the first bat that I remember that I played sort of hardball cricket with. And, uh, yeah, I think it yeah. is that. I think could be wrong. Cool. <laughs> so um, this one is from Prasad. Um, you've mentioned, you touched on the, the, the spin side of things and, and those things, but I want to know what you, I also wanted to actually know this. What did you learn from Amal? So when he came into the system and helped you guys there on your, on your tour, to your SA tour, etc., and also he was yeah. part of this A side, and obviously with the protein side. What did you learn from him? Um, they say that he's a, yeah. this guy says he's the spin India master, India spin master. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we, I, I, I was lucky enough to do two. I've been on two spin camps, and both spin yeah. camps, I'm always the the batting coach on the spin camp, along with the coaches that came from South Africa. But he was the. Um, you can't say recruit because it's in India, but he was the sort of outsourced coach that we used. Um, so I knew him really well before he got to the Proteus. Um, and every, the first spin camp, and then I compared to the second spin camp, um, there was a three-year gap between the two, the two that I went on. Um, and the second one that I went on, we really clicked and we really got on like a house on fire. Um, so I learned a lot and I picked his brain and, and like you say, in India, he's, he's, he's legends. I mean, his stats are amazing. and He just played in the era behind, like Sachin and Raul. And, I mean, it's just a short end of the stick because in, in most other generations, he would have played for years for India. Um, so who better to learn from a guy who scores tens of thousands of runs in, in their conditions in, in first-class cricket? So he was a great guy to, to learn from and helped a lot. Um, he helped a lot with... And, and they use a very different language there. Um, language I, I'm talking about, like crease confidence and things like that. Things we don't hear too much of in South Africa, or we'll hear of it, but it's said in a different way. Um, so it's, it was nice having it come from a, a different, um, like I say, in a different language. Um, and it came across in a different way. And yeah, we just clicked and he's helped me quite a bit with game plans to spin and, and approaching spinners and how to put them under pressure, not just trying to survive and things like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, this is an awesome one as well, um, because I also wanted to know this. How much does your technique change after you become a professional cricketer? Did yours change much um, from, obviously, the transition? Um, I've tried to not change it too much. I do think the longer you go on, small things do change. Um but I don't think I just I do, I'll be honest with you. I think the biggest challenges and the biggest changes do have to come mentally. Um, mm. So your techniques got you there for a reason. Um, and the, probably the biggest adjustment to to international cricket, besides the actual skill specific thing, is the, being able to deal with it mentally. Um, the pressures that come with it, the pressures you you can't have faced before because the domestic setup and um, cricket before that doesn't come with the same hype, it doesn't come with the yeah. same responsibility, it doesn't come with the same crowd and, and effect from the media and all those things that add up. Um, so you can't train for it. So mentally you have to be incredibly strong to um, find ways to get through it. So from an actual technique point of view, I don't think, I'd, if I look at myself, I probably have changed quite a bit from, but from mm. really trying to change my technique, from making an actual effort to change it, I don't, 
think we've spent too much time doing. Hmm. Um, Ravi wants to know, tell me about your routine before you come out to bed. How many net sessions do you complete? So we have as much training as we can building up to a game. Um, and then the morning of the game, I used to just hit balls into the net, but at a very relaxed, so not even with pads, on just bat and gloves um, and go through the shots, and, and that would be me. I'd be happy. Um, but since I was injured with my wrists after this recent India series, it was only with the Titans, but I made an effort. Even the mornings now of the game, I went to have a full net session as well. Mm. Um, and it really helped me because the reason I never did it was because if I had a bad net that morning, I'd go into the game with such a such a negative frame of mind. So that's why I didn't do it because I was like, there's enough happening on game day. Now you don't want to make it worse because you had a bad net in the morning. Um, so I just stayed away from it. But then I, over the years, I've now been able to, and I say it like I'm experienced, I'm not at all, but I've now, <laughs> I'm learning that the net that you have on the morning um just I'm just seeing it as a, a case of getting me up and getting me going like a warm up would. Yeah. And I felt it helped a lot from from ball one. Um I'm not saying that you feel in, but it just feels like you're moving slightly better. Um so the net can be a bad net, but I know I leave the net feeling more sharp and feeling more switched on, which is probably at the end of the day what you're after if you have any hit um warning mm -hmm. over the game. Yeah. Um, do you ever um, watch any old cricket videos as part of preparation? Perhaps like, for example, Jimmy Anderson bowling or Broad Bowl before you bat? Mm. I know you haven't faced him yet, but yeah. So we, we our video analyst persona, he's brilliant. Um, mm. And he can literally get you any video that you're after. So we've got a WhatsApp group where you'll send footage of uh, the bowling attack that you're going to come across. Um, their plans... All like everything, the paces they bowl. Um, so it's a very detailed thing that it, that that we get sent, um, and it comes straight onto your phone on WhatsApp. And what you do with it is 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 what you want. So some guys love studying the, the information, where some guys might just quick quickly skim through it, or you get someone who will just not even open the videos because that's just their own preference. Um, I'll often do quite a lot of homework to the bowlers that I haven't faced before um, mm. and to mystery spinners, for example. I'll try to study them as much as I can just to get a bit of a feel. Um, but guys that I have come across in the past, I don't do too much on because then I, I just go from a mental side of things and, and try to take the positives that I was able to do against them um, and take that into my preparation sort of and, and, and not look too much into them and, and what they do. Cool. That's an awesome answer. Um, Bevan Weaver wants to know, um, what would you like to achieve in test cricket? Any milestones, particularly? I have not sent milestones out at all, no. Um, I've always been wanted to be or be part of a team that finishes number one in the world. Um, that's the only uh, dream I have from test cricket. Uh, I don't have X amount of games I want to play. I don't have X amount of runs I want to score. Um, and I think it's very different now because I'm, I need to play for a spot again. So yeah. <laughs> those milestones go to, am I ever going to play test cricket again? You know what I'm saying? So, hey, um, hey, hey, don't say that. <laughs> slightly different. <laughs> no, but it, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's yeah. slightly different. Um, but definitely not a, a milestone um, guy, really, to be fair. Yeah, I'm hoping that all of those those hours that I spent playing with um, – you on that cricket games that are playing, you are all <laughs> scoring a big hundred on you. So get yourself yeah, back. That would be there. great. <laughs> so um, who is your buddy at the Proteus? Would you say? I mean, you probably are friends with majority of them, but who do you who you hmm. who do you spend most of your spare time with, etc.? There's, I mean, we we're often in big groups. To be honest, um, I spend when Zubi's in the team, we spend quite a lot of time together. That's Zubi Hamza. Uh, <laughs> And then I do spend a lot of time with Dean as well. Um, but like I said, I, we mingle so much and it'll just go on the group. X, Y, and Z is going to do this. Um, whoever's keen, we meet in downstairs in an hour's time or whatever. So a lot of the things are done together. But, um, and those two is, is two of the guys that I do see a lot of on tour. 
Cool. And let's just speed this up a bit, a little bit more, because I know you have yeah. a you have a lot of you need a lot of time. But what are you doing in your yeah. spare time, Aiden? Um, look, in lockdown, it's completely different to normal. So I go <laughs> normal life. Um, normal life, I, I spend a lot of time with my friends and family. So uh, getting back from a tour, I'll, I'll make sure I get around to seeing all of them and spending quality time with them. Um, and then whenever I get a, a long enough break, we we try to get to the the bush as much as we can. So. I love it out there. Um, it's a place where I can completely switch off and mm -hmm. feel completely refreshed when I get back home. Um, there's times where I'll just lay at home, lay, stay at home for a week, but I don't get that same sort of refreshness, if that's a word, um, that I get from if yeah. I'm at the bush or not. So uh, those are the few cool. things, and then spend quite a bit of time nowadays on the golf course as well. So okay, those awesome. three things generally are the things, yeah. Okay, and with regards to um, lockdown itself, um, what what sort of things are you doing now currently in lockdown? And look, we luckily we can run around now in the mornings. Um, so quite a few times in the week we, we'll go for a run, and, and that's quite nice because it's something different. Um, and then we've got fitness programs that we need to keep up to date with and, and keep fit and strong um, as much as we can during lockdown with what we have at home. So those are the, the two almost everyday things that are happening. Um, the rest, it's uh, building bedside tables and chipping around the <laughs> golf ball in the garden or uh, random things you find doing, building puzzles at the start. Um, those sort of things you, you just sort of happen to find an interest in for a couple of days and then you lose interest, but at least it, it settles the mind for a few days. Okay, awesome. Um, and there's another cricketing one. Um, your favorite bowler in domestic cricket? Um, <laughs> it's a difficult one. <laughs> it is a difficult one, yeah. And I, I, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to say a Titans player because that's very biased. So, uh, sure. Magala is always um, always a bowler who does well in, in domestic cricket. And um, the last few years, I haven't actually read in. I've played a lot of of red ball domestic cricket. It's been a lot of white ball. And that's why I say Magala as well, because he's got he's got great skills. He's got a really good slow ball and now it is Yorker. So mm. um he to so top of my mind it would would be the one that I say I'm, I'm definitely leaving out a few. Um but yeah they he he's definitely a very challenging bowler to face. Cool. And um, do you do you watch any Premier League or Super Rugby and perhaps both Stormers and, and United? Perhaps this is these teams he's speaking. <laughs> um, I don't watch much soccer, to be honest. Uh, I watch a lot of rugby. Um, I like the Stormers, but they're not my number one fight. Uh, the Bulls have to be. Um, but from a soccer perspective, I, I can't give you much, to be honest. So, but a lot of rugby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know you're a big rugby fan. I mean, the World Cup, yeah. um, that win, um, where exactly were you? So we, strangely enough, had a, a CSA team building weekend in Durban. Mm. Um, I so we were, we were all together. It was quite cool. Um, a lot of the um, management and, and organizers and administrators from CSA were there. I think there was almost 200 people there or something, if I'm not mistaken. And so it was a massive, almost like a conference, to be fair. Um, but all the players were there as well. So at least we were together and able to watch the game together. It was quite a, a cool morning. Okay. I'm taking two more questions, guys. Um, just one more is, what's your favorite food? At, uh, any home prize, is, <laughs> it doesn't do it for me. Um, but if I think, if, if I must think away from home... Uh, I enjoy, I do enjoy a nice pizza. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, let's go with with uh, Bry and, and pizza. Um, okay, so this is a, okay, this one is a nice one because I remember seeing this. So um, talk about the century you scored in the record partnership with, with Alga at Newlands when the Titans were five down quickly and you came in. This was in the One Day Cup. Mm, so I think it was a fudgy. Yeah, it was a fudgy. Um, fudgy, yeah. Um, yeah, so I batted five that day. And it was actually the first time I batted five uh, at franchise to get in a one-day game. 
and we were in trouble early. Uh, so it, the nice part for me was it was almost like I was opening the batting or batting number three because I was, I was I was in there quite early. So my game plan was didn't have to change. It, it was the same as batting somewhere in the top order. So from a, a blessing in disguise point of view, that I was really fortunate for that. Um, and look, it's almost a, a scenario where you, you can only get the team into a winning position because from 30 for 5, you, you're probably not meant to win the game. Um, or the odds are, are highly against you. So I just remember Fadi and I kept saying to each other, we, we've got to be here in the 40th over. And, and if we're there in the 40th over, uh, anything can happen from there because we still had um, Mori in the hut. And don't say I said this, but Junior was there as well. And he can he's finished a few games for the Titans. So. <laughs> Um, but don't tell him I said that. <laughs> um, yeah, and we just we just kept saying um, we got to be there in the fortieth over, and from there, pretty much anything can happen. Um, yeah. And I think I just remember things kept going our way. I mean, I was dropped a few times, uh, missed run out chance. So luck was was on our side, which is strange as well because we were behind the game, um, and normally things just snowball effect. But we were lucky in the sense that we. We had a bit of luck on our side and, and we were able to run with it. And then the bowlers defended what we bowled, but yeah, it was, it was quite a cool game to be a part of. And to, to win the game from the position we were in was, was certainly quite cool. Cool, awesome. So there's two shout outs, um, and that's to end it. Um, Aiden, Team Silver won their <laughs> fifth straight title on the right of Edith Swiss Quiz. How about a shout out for the lads? <laughs> Absolutely. And I was following as well, but then I fell asleep. Um, <laughs> But a massive shout out. What legend. <laughs> <laughs> and Sadiq just said he's a massive fan. If you can just say hi to him, please. <laughs> hi, Sadiq. Shame. Hope you're well, man. <laughs> so, guys, thanks a lot for tuning into this. Um, I really enjoyed, again, having a conversation with you, um, Aiden. And I hope that in the future we can get you more on the show. Um, I just want you to give one more message to the Cricket Fanatics fans out there. That's all. Uh, look, I... I could don't have too much right now. I haven't played cricket in months. Um, but I can promise you that after lockdown, uh, things might be different, but it's very important that our fans, who mean so much to us, are still as involved in the game as, as what they were before lockdown. And like I said, they are going to be, it's going to be slightly weird and slightly different to, to the, to the usual. Um, but like I've, uh, like I've mentioned, their, their support is, is massive too. Whichever team that they're supporting, whether it be a club side or an international side, um, the support goes a long way. So we appreciate the support um, and, and hopefully we can continue to find ways, even after lockdown, to, to get you into stadiums and, and watching and supporting the game. Cool. So thanks a lot, guys, for tuning in. Don't forget to obviously press the subscribe button, like and share this video. We're going to put it on our website. So, and Aiden, I'll send you the link too, so you can share it with your guys as well if you want to. Um, <laughs> but uh, th thanks to all of you guys. And don't forget, um, we're starting a new segment tonight. Um, it's Legends with Ravi, where Ravi speaks about different types of legends in the game that he's witnessed play. And he's going to indicate me about cricket in the past. So that's, that's <laughs> going to be an awesome experience. Um, and also, guys, tune into our podcast on a Sunday evening where you guys get to ask us questions and we answer you. It's a show about you guys. So um, tune into all our platforms, etc. Thanks a lot, Aiden, again for coming on. Sure, no problem. This is <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, so...